Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Professor Michael Cox. I'm in the Department of International Relations, and I'm also uh, one of the two co-directors with my colleague and good friend, uh, Professor Arnie Westad, who is also sitting in the audience. And welcome to you all. And welcome again to uh, Professor Neil Ferguson, uh, the Philippe Bramont Professor here at the LSE in the Centre Ideas. Neil, as you know, is the fourth uh, Philippe uh, Ramon professor. The first was uh, Paul Kennedy. The second, the historian of China in the Cold War, Chen Jian. And the third, the French expert on Islam last year, Gilles uh, Capel. The Philippe Ramon is made possible by a very generous donation by Emmanuel Ramon. The chair, named after his father, Philippe, has brought as I'm sure you'll find out tonight and found out over the previous few years, uh, world-class scholars to the LSE in London, and by so doing made the school, I'm sure you'll agree, an infinitely richer and livelier place. Now, Neil, as I'm sure you are aware, uh, takes few prisoners. And in his last three lectures in this idea series on the Cold War, he has, if I might put it like this, slashed and burned his way, like a true Scotsman, of course, across the political and intellectual landscape. Thus, in his first lecture, we were told that we should not, look, should not look for the deeper sources of the end of the Cold War in the 1980s in moribund Europe, but in emerging Asia. In his second lecture, we were shown why the Cold War was not the orderly long peace, as claimed by some writers, but rather a distinctly bloody affair fought out in the Third World. And the third lecture a few weeks ago mounted a spirited, but I'd say not uncritical, defence of one Henry Kissinger, I think the subject of Neil's uh, next biography. So tonight in this fourth lecture in this series we await even more fireworks from the man who knows Davos like the back of his hand and has made PowerPoint a genuine art form. It is even said that Neil does a genuinely good imitation of George VI <laughs> or Colin Firth. Indeed, he looks somewhat like him. Did you not see him in Los Angeles? A question today was asked in the Evening Standard, Neil's paper of choice. <laughs> I had to get that one in. The title of the little short piece in the Evening Standard today, which I picked up coming up from Clapham, Neil's nod to the King's speech. Has Neil Ferguson been taking acting lessons? The historian speaking at the Intelligence Squared talk last night, whatever that is, sponsored by the Evening Standard on the six killer apps of civilization. Neil, you must avoid cliché. <laughs> Opened with a bout of stammering in a nod to Colin Firth's George VI. He also did an impression of an 18th century Boswell and spent much of the evening parading around the Cadogan Hall stage in the spirit of Barnum. Now, I hope you don't do all these things tonight, Neil. However, I think it does give us a pretty good indication that Neil is not only a great historian, but he's great fun as an historian and a great popular historian who wants to get some really important ideas across to more than a few people. Neil, as I said back in November when I introduced you, it's been fun having you here, and indeed more than fun. It's been a real intellectual treat. We look forward to hearing what you have to say on the theme of tonight's lecture, Nuclear Weapons and Human Rights, LSE. Can we give an LSE welcome? Not to, Neil, not to Neil Ferguson, I was about to say, but to Colin Firth and George VI imitating Neil Ferguson. Neil Ferguson. Well, I wasn't going to do my stutter, but... You have to now. This is an opportunity to do it as we uh, frantically load the presentation. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, there'll be no Barnum-like antics or shameless playing to the gallery uh, this evening. Uh, rather, what I want to try to do is uh, to draw together some of the threads of my previous uh, lectures on the Cold War and to arrive at some kind of conclusion. In particular, I want to explore the not immediately obvious relationship between the nuclear arms race and the growth of human rights as a concern of international relations in the era of the Cold War. There is, of course, another 
purpose to this evening's lecture, and I would be entirely mendacious if I didn't point it out. <laughs> and that purpose is to encourage you uh, to buy uh, my new book, <laughs> which, uh, as it happens, is published this very week, copies of which are indeed for sale outside this very lecture hall. And if you're feeling impecunious, uh, then you can instead watch the accompanying television series uh, on Channel 4, which goes out uh, on Sunday evening. Uh, now, at first I was a little uncertain as to how I could simultaneously conclude a lecture series on the Cold War and promote this book. Hmm. <laughs> Since it will by now have struck you that they are on entirely different subjects. <laughs> And then, of course, uh, inspiration uh, came to my rescue, as it often does with the clock ticking in the direction of 6 p.m. I want to draw your attention to an article published in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists in 1962. One of, it should be said, a great many uh, publications by scientists uh, in the late 1950s and the early 1960s on the subject of what a nuclear conflict would do to civilization. It's not enough to judge solely by the probability of people being killed, uh, wrote the author of this article. Another tragic aspect of nuclear war is that irreplaceable aspects of civilization will be destroyed. And I couldn't resist continuing. If we let the symbol V represent the value of civilization destroyed by war, a more meaningful question is <laughs> where P is the probability that a typical person will be killed if war occurs, W is the probability that war will occur, the index S denotes with shelters, and O denotes without a shelter program. <laughs> this is, after all, the London School of Economics and Political Science, and that is a kind of political science. Rather less uh, mathematically, rather more emotively, uh, Linus Pauling addressed the question would civilization survive a nuclear war uh, in the book he published with that title in 1963? Pauling uh, is an extraordinary, was an extraordinary figure. I think the only man to win two Nobel Prizes in his own right. Neither was shared. One for chemistry and one for peace. He was a quantum chemist. He also made major contributions to biological science. But his political activism in the period after World War II uh, led him uh, into some difficulty. He was viewed by many, particularly by the McCarthyites, as uh, a fellow traveler, an apologist indeed for the Soviet Union, and uh, didn't in fact have his passport it had been uh, removed uh, when he uh, was first invited to collect a Nobel Prize, though the US government hastily restored it uh, to him. Life magazine described his Peace Prize in 1962 as, quote, a weird insult from Norway. <laughs> Pauling's uh, is one of many uh, similar essays I could quote from. Uh, you could go back uh, further to the mid-1950s uh, letter of which he was a co-signatory, but which is best known uh, as the work of Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell, uh, which called on mankind to renounce war altogether rather than run the risk of unleashing a thermonuclear war with all the catastrophic consequences that would have. A kind of post-war cons consensus actually emerged even before that famous scientist's letter. Harry Truman confided in his own diary uh, not very long after he himself had authorized the use of uh, atomic weapons, the human animal must change now 
or he faces absolute and complete destruction, and maybe the insect age or an atmosphereless planet will succeed him. Just three years later, uh, Joseph Stalin himself uh, observed atomic weapons can hardly be used without spelling the end of the world. This was the man who at first had reacted to the news that the Americans had the bomb by describing atomic weapons as toys to frighten children. But that was bravado. That was a bluff. And one can find similar quotations from nearly all the superpower leaders of the Cold War era. You didn't need to be a nuclear physicist or a quantum chemist to grasp that something profound had changed in the nature of war itself with the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And indeed, with the creation of the hydrogen bomb, a weapon far more destructive than Little Boy, the weapon that was dropped in Japan, an, all, an entirely new era in human civilization had begun. An era in which the possibility existed that civilization could self-destruct. And that's why, in fact, it is an appropriate subject uh, for me to discuss this evening. Not only because I believe the relationship between nuclear weapons and human rights offers the key to understanding why the Cold War remained cold and ended as it ended, but also because it helps you to understand why I've written a book called Civilization. When I was an undergraduate, as many of you now are undergraduates, it was extremely fashionable to be a member of the campaign for nuclear disarmament. Indeed, my very best friend at Oxford was uh, a member and wore proudly uh, the badge which you see uh, in graffiti form uh, on this wall. The membership of CND actually peaked uh, in my second year at Oxford. Uh, that was the height of, of its of popularity and perhaps also of its influence as an organization. I was not a member. I have, in fact, to confess that I was rather opposed to CND. And though I blush to admit it, I still possess somewhere uh, in my files uh, an invitation to a party that one of my friends threw. This was a party to celebrate the deployment of cruise and Pershing missiles in Western Europe. And I'm afraid to say that the illustration that we chose for the invitation was a champagne bottle with a mushroom cloud emerging from its neck. <laughs> I tell you this only to illustrate that uh, puerile humor is characteristic of all generations uh, of undergraduates and is not something you should subsequently be embarrassed about. Uh, though if this were to be posted on Facebook, I'm sure it would do untold damage to my reputation for seriousness. What was amazing for somebody of my generation, I've described myself in the past as a punk Tory, and I'll talk more about the jam in just a moment, um, the original punk Tories of the late 70s and early 80s, was that within just a few years, even months, of that party, which we only threw to inflame the ire of the Oxford student left, which it did. The only point of that party was to upset the left, and they could always be relied upon to be hugely upset by that sort of thing. <laughs> but just within a very short space of time after that, uh, we were aghast to find that Ronald Reagan had joined the campaign for nuclear disarmament. Reagan, who had in the initial phase of his presidency been far more hawkish uh, on all Cold War issues than almost any of his predecessors, did a complete vault fast on this issue in one of the great judo moves of Cold War diplomacy. Embracing proposals for disarmament uh, that appeared tentatively from the Soviet side, 
Uh, Reagan suddenly came out in favor of a solution to the problem far more radical than his advisors had imagined in their wildest nightmares. He described nuclear weapons as, quote, totally irrational, totally inhumane, good for nothing but killing, possibly destructive of life on Earth and civilization. These days, everybody is a member of CND, so there's no point in joining, which is why its formal membership is much lower than it was in 1984. Among the honorary members today are none other than Henry Kissinger, not to mention Sam Nunn, Bill Perry, and George Schultz, who, as you will doubtless be aware, have published a series of articles in the last three years calling for a complete abolition of nuclear weapons. When I interviewed Kissinger, uh, which I did at great length over the last few years as part of the research uh, for my biography of him, he said something very arresting, which was that in his view, anxiety about climate change uh, and global warming, as we used to call it, was a form of displacement activity, distracting people's attention from the far more imminent threat uh, of a nuclear uh, conflict, or even simply of an accidental detonation of a nuclear weapon. With the breakdown of any <coughs> effective uh, ban on proliferation of nuclear weapons, and I think that is what we are witnessing, the dangers of their use are in fact significantly higher just in probabilistic terms, than they were during the Cold War when, for a time, only two powers possessed them. So, one way of thinking about the period since the early 1980s is as a kind of triumph, a triumph very few people would have predicted for CND itself. Surely there could be no bigger triumph than to have Henry Kissinger as an honorary member. But wait a minute. It may seem odd to identify the A-bomb as one of the greatest creations of Western civilization. Though it dramatically increased the capacity of man to inflict death, the bomb's net effect was to reduce the scale and destructiveness of war beginning by averting the need for a bloody amphibious invasion of Japan. The atomic bomb, and even more so the vastly more destructive hydrogen bomb tested in 1952 and a year later by the Soviets, circumscribed that war and all subsequent conflicts by deterring the United States and the Soviet Union from colliding head-on. You see, I'm unrepentant, because these words are from my newly published book, <laughs> Civilization the West and the Rest, pages 235 to 6. It seems as if I am on the wrong side of this argument if sheer weight of numbers is decisive. Because what I try to show in civilization is that the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb were in many ways the supreme achievement of Western civilization. <coughs> And this is the kind of paradoxical idea from which, for which I am justly notorious. But think of it. What exactly happened as a result of the Manhattan Project, named because it began life in the Manhattan Engineering District in 1942? That project, which produced in all three devices that were in fact exploded, one mustn't forget the first one that was dropped or exploded rather in New Mexico, had been inspired by Albert Einstein himself, who had warned Roosevelt of the real danger that the Germans might be first to acquire such a weapon, given, of course, Germany's still meaningful lead in many fields of scientific endeavor. Certainly up until 1933, few would have argued that Germany was the world's preeminent scientific power. It was, the bomb that is, an achievement of 
Western civilization properly understood because it was a multinational achievement. Although the Americans had the resources, they did not produce the atomic bomb alone. Indeed, if it hadn't been for the British realization of the fissile properties of the isotope uranium-235, the whole project might never have got past first or second base. If you look at the scientists who were involved in the Manhattan Project, you realize that it was the most extraordinarily diverse group of people. Australians, Britons, Canadians, Danes, Germans, Hungarians, Italians, one Swiss, and of course, Americans. There were Jewish refugees from Hitler, Otto Frisch and Edward uh, Teller among them. And in that sense, the Manhattan Project exemplified one of those killer applications that are so central to the argument of my new book. I was teased a moment ago by Mick, who suggested it was a cliché uh, to refer to the decisive institutional innovations of Western civilization as killer apps. I'm not sure that's quite fair, Mick. It certainly represents a deliberate attempt on my part to appeal to a youthful audience. <laughs> And there's nothing wrong with that, since anything we can do to interest teenagers in history seems to me to be a worthwhile step, given that they know almost nothing about history, <laughs> thanks to the efforts of British secondary schools. <laughs> but the killer app, which I rank as the second in importance, and certainly chronologically came second, was science, indeed the scientific revolution personified uh, by Newton, uh, but also in some ways personified by the much less famous figure of Benjamin Robbins. Robbins it was who applied Newtonian physics uh, to ballistics and for the first time made artillery a truly scientific activity. Science was truly a killer app because it made Western civilization better at one of the most important aspects of modern warfare, the destruction of enemy cities. And nothing destroys an enemy city more completely and more efficiently than a nuclear bomb. In that sense, in that most stark sense, we need to recognize that the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb were quintessential achievements of Western civilization that no other civilization could have produced. That mutant version of Western civilization National Socialist Germany could not do it. Even with the brilliant scientists that remained after Hitler purged the German science of its large and brilliant Jewish community. The critical question, of course, is whether we just got lucky. Whether we just got lucky that this killer application did not end up killing civilization itself. The big question, in other words, is why there never was a hot war. Why these weapons were not used in anger at any point during the Cold War. And you might legitimately say, if you wish to criticize me, which you are welcome to do in the question and answer session, at your own risk, you might well say, I'm underestimating the risk. Just because they weren't used doesn't mean that at the time there was no risk of their being used. We know that in the first phase of the Cold War, uh, during uh, Harry Truman's presidency, influential figures in the United States favored the use one more time of the atomic bomb to establish American primacy in the nascent Cold War. The Democratic si uh, Senator Brian McMahon was one of them. General Orville Anderson, who was the commanding officer of the U.S. Air War College, was another. Then there was General George Kenney, who was the commanding officer of Strategic Air Command. His successor, the notorious Curtis LeMay, uh, was perhaps the most ardent enthusiast for the use uh, of atomic weapons, an enthusiasm he never lost. And then there was General Douglas MacArthur, who at a crucial moment in the Korean War, after China's intervention had radically changed the game to the disadvantage of the United Nations forces, argued 
that nuclear or other atomic bombs should be used against Chinese positions to end the war swiftly. Advice which Harry Truman decided not to follow, but which was by no means regarded as maverick advice by ordinary Americans. Asked if they favored using atomic artillery shells against communist forces if Korean truce talks break down, 56% of Americans said yes during the Korean War's stalemate phase. And arguments for the use of nuclear weapons continued uh, through the Eisenhower period and were on a number of occasions taken seriously by President Eisenhower himself. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff under Eisenhower Admiral Arthur Radford was one of those who argued for the use uh, of nuclear weapons preemptively in order to win the Third World War while the United States still had a significant lead, which it had throughout the 1950s and into the 1960s. Henry Kissinger, if you'll forgive me for reverting to the subject, was one of the most influential public intellectuals of the 1950s and early 1960s after he published the book Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy in 1957. That book caused a stir and made his reputation because it argued that a system uh, of massive retaliation, a strategic doctrine based only on the notion of using nuclear weapons to bring about Armageddon, made no sense. And that a strategic doctrine needed, if it were to be effective, to include the possibility of the limited use of nuclear weapons. The core argument of that book is that there should be a limited use uh, for nuclear weapons and that it wasn't binary, peace or Armageddon. This was the book that made Kissinger's reputation and it repays reading today. To develop the point further, let me take you to perhaps the most famous moment in the entire Cold War. Saturday afternoon, October the 27th, 1962, the height or nadir of the Cuban Missile Crisis. It would certainly not be a good use of our time for me to replay the entire saga uh, that led uh, Khrushchev to deploy nuclear weapons uh, on the island of Cuba. Suffice to say, assuming that you know the broad outlines of the story, there came a moment that afternoon when President John F. Kennedy had to consider seriously doing something more than merely imposing a naval blockade to prevent further shipments by the Soviets to Cuba. O-Plan 316 was intended to be an amphibious invasion of Cuba. The President and his brother joked that if this were to be done, Bobby Kennedy could be the mayor of Havana, Robert McNamara, uh, then the Defense Secretary, urged that this option be considered seriously and so, perhaps not entirely surprisingly, did the military men, including LeMay. What they did not know, because their intelligence, though good, good enough at least to identify what the Soviets were up to in Cuba, was not good enough to tell them that the Soviets had already on Cuba... 80 short-range missiles armed with nuclear warheads, each with an explosive power between 5 and 12 kilotons, plus six warheads for their IL-28 bombers, and another nine frog lunar missiles suitable for use uh, in battlefield encounters, short-range nuclear missiles. If the Americans had opted to launch the invasion of Cuba, O-Plan 316, it is highly likely that at least some of those weapons would have been used to destroy the American force uh, on the beaches as it landed. Castro, a hero inexplicably to many young people at the time and subsequently, eagerly looked forward to what would have surely reduced the island of Cuba to a pile of ash. Fortunately, of course, 
both Khrushchev and Kennedy drew back from this nightmare scenario. But the moment when the Russians shot down a U-2 spy plane over Cuba with a missile was the moment when the Cold War came closest to being a hot war. One cannot say after the fact that the probability of a full-scale nuclear war was zero throughout the Cold War. Manifestly, it was not. And the participants in those key meetings that weekend on both sides subsequently acknowledged the extent of their fear, or in some cases exhilaration, as the world teetered on the brink of a Third World War. My late lamented colleague at Harvard, Ernie May, was a young advisor around the White House during those crucial hours. And I can tell you that there really was no more enthralling experience to have while he was still teaching at Harvard than to hear him describe what it was like as Kennedy weighed the options, weighed up the domestic political implications, weighed up the military implications, thought through the diplomatic and strategic implications of what could have been the single most disastrous decision in the history of international relations. The funny thing is, given that that was, that was the closest brush with Armageddon, we all appear to have worried more about a nuclear war uh, some 20 years later. It was in the early 1980s when, as I mentioned, CND reached its uh, height of popularity and influence, that fear in the Western world of a nuclear war reached its height. I remember this uh, vividly, and it's easy to track empirically thanks to the marvels uh, of Google. If you haven't discovered the Google Books uh, uh, n-gram uh, program, uh, check it out, because it allows you to check the frequency uh, of words or phrases in any of the publications that Google has so far scanned, which is a very large number of publications indeed. Uh, and this blue line shows you uh, the uh, percentage of these uh, documents where the words uh, nuclear war occur from 1945 uh, to 2000. So the, the, the proportion of words, in effect, that are the phrase uh, nuclear war. There was not surprisingly, a spike uh, in the early 1960s. But the peak came in the early 1980s when I was an undergraduate facetiously celebrating the deployment of weapons of mass destruction in my own country. 1982 was the year Sir John Hackett published The Third World War, August 1985. I suspect not a great many people in this room have read the book, but it's uh, one of a really quite uh, fascinating genre, uh, works of futurology, uh, which were extremely popular in the 1980s, uh, and most of which considered, at least uh, in part of the text, the possibility of a nuclear war. Hackett's was uh, perhaps the most serious of these books because he knew what he was talking about, uh, and he consulted uh, other senior NATO uh, military personnel in writing the book. The scenario that he imagines is a war that gets started uh, in, of all places, Yugoslavia. How implausible. Wars never happen there. <laughs> and in the scenario that he, uh, he depicts, the Soviets use this uh, small crisis as the pretext for a massive conventional forces assault on Western Europe. This assault does not go as well as the Soviets had planned. Uh, Packett was uh, smart enough to understand the defects that were already beginning to become apparent to the, civil, uh, to the uh, uh, intelligence services of Soviet military capability. Uh, and so the Soviet forces run aground pretty much in Krefeld. In desperation, recognizing that their ploy has failed, the Soviets try to clinch the conflict by obliterating Birmingham. As an Arsenal fan, yes, I, yes. I can't help being quite attracted to that idea this week. 
And in return, uh, NATO obliterates Minsk. I don't know if you've ever been to Minsk, but I would have thought it would be quite hard to tell uh, if Minsk had been destroyed by a nuclear weapon. Now, I shouldn't be frivolous. It's too serious a subject. Uh, the scenario unfolds further, and perhaps implausibly, with the overthrow of the warmongering Politburo by, of all people, Ukrainian nationalists. That was the kind of stuff we read, wasn't it? It was pretty much standard fare on the op-ed pages uh, of The Guardian. And I think it's difficult for your generation, and here I address the majority of uh, students in the room, to imagine what it felt like to live under that mushroom cloud, whether you did it ironically as I did, or desperately earnestly as my friend did, who went on those dreary marches to Aldermaster. Even Kittywinks could enjoy the thrill, the terror, that creeping sensation of imagining what the Third World War would be like. Raymond Briggs' best-selling cartoon book, When the Wind Blows, depicts an ordinary, bumbling British elderly couple coping with the reality of nuclear war. This was in everybody's house. I don't know that there was any middle-class family in the entire country that didn't possess at least one well-thumbed copy of this book, usually in the downstairs loo for some reason. And as I promised, there was the jam. There's an A-bomb in Wardour Street, where the streets are paved with blood with cataclysmic overtones, fear and hate linger in the air, a strictly no-go deadly zone. I don't know what I'm doing here, because it's not my scene at all. There's an A-bomb in Wardour Street. They've called in the army. They've called in the police, too. That was one of the jam's hit singles, 1978 vintage, and very much a part of the atmosphere I'm trying uh, to remind you of or explain to you. An atmosphere in which the probability of nuclear war was regarded as high, probably much higher than it really was at the time, but we were scared. And one of the peculiarities of life in the 1980s was how to get on with life if there was this non-zero probability. Now, do I have a tactical nuclear weapon? <laughs> One of the great things of the 1980s was, of course, that there were no mobile phones. It wasn't all bad. Paul Weller was on stage thrashing it out on his Rickenbacker, and nobody's phone was going off. Mind you, if it had gone off, you wouldn't have heard it, because they did turn up those guitars pretty loud. The big question is, therefore, why it didn't happen. That's the critical question of the whole Cold War. It's the, the 500 megaton question, if you like. Well, you'll remember that uh, in the second lecture of uh, this series, I explored one of the most influential essays that's been published on the Cold War by that uh, leading authority on the subject, Paul Kennedy's colleague at Yale, John Gaddis. In the long piece, as I, as I said then, Gaddis offers seven reasons why the Cold War did not become hot. Bipolarity, the extent to which there was dependence as well as interdependence, the domestic restraints, but crucially, number four, deterrence. Paranoia and prudence, Gaddis argues, can coexist in a nuclear world. He also emphasizes the importance of reconnaissance. The increasing quality of reconnaissance by both sides meant that there was a transparency to the arms race uh, that, he argues, made it more rather than less stable. Then, of course, he comes to ideological factors, the increasing moderation of ideologies on both sides, and the so-called rules of the game. But it's really number four that concerns us here, because it's number four which explains, according to Gaddis, why the nuclear war doesn't take place. What I want to do is to explore exactly what in practice 
paranoia and prudence meant uh, when they interacted. Question one. Was it mutually assured destruction that worked in Cuba? We know that both Kennedy and Khrushchev had alarming estimates from their military uh, advisors about what a nuclear war would cost in terms of human life. In the early 1960s, uh, the US estimates ranged from 40 to the mid-60 million mark for the United States alone. Fatalities. And that, of course, uh, was the kind of number that you would expect a normal person to be deterred by. You just have to bear in mind that normal people do not become presidents of countries like the United States, much less do normal people rise to the top of the Soviet Communist Party. So one can't simply assume that these startling numbers did the job. What happened? Well, what happened was that Khrushchev blinked twice, in fact. He made two offers to try to avoid a military showdown over Cuba. One, which came by private telegram, was that he would withdraw the missiles as long as the Americans gave a guarantee not to invade Cuba, which, after all, they had tried to do at the Bay of Pigs not so very long before. The second was rather more hardball and came in the form of a public radio broadcast. On that, Khrushchev said he would withdraw the missiles, but only if the Americans uh, at the same time withdrew their missiles uh, from Turkey, a NATO member where Jupiter missiles had been deployed. This put Kennedy in an awkward position. It would certainly have been interpreted as softness had he agreed to the second proposal publicly. In what they called the Trollope ploy, he and his advisers decided to ignore the radio broadcast offer and simply to treat the private telegram as the basis for a deal and to write back accepting it in highly formal language. However, particularly after the news of the U-2 shooting down, Kennedy decided to take no chances and opened up two back-channel lines of communication to make sure things did not escalate further. Bobby Kennedy was sent to the Soviet ambassador Brenin and told essentially to agree to the Turkish missile, Cuban missile swap. Before that had been uh, so much as inked, uh, Khrushchev amazed the Americans again by accepting the softer Trollope ploy deal. So at first sight, and this is I think how many historians interpret it, this was a case where two parties came to the brink, looked over it, saw hundreds of millions of dead, and drew back. Mutually assured destruction in action, no? Except for one puzzling feature. The Soviets should have been deterred at a much earlier stage from the adventure of deploying missiles to Cuba. At the time that they did this, the American advantage in terms of nuclear capability was a staggering nine to one. The notion of mutually assured destruction presupposes some kind of parity. But there was no parity. If it had come to a hot war uh, in 1962, the United States would have won it comfortably. Not, of course, without sustaining some losses in human life. But to me, the great puzzle of the Cuban Missile Crisis is that the Russians were prepared to go as far as they did when their position was so manifestly vulnerable. In that sense, I don't buy the idea that the outcome of the Cuban Missile Crisis was the result of some strategic equipoise, mutually assured destruction. Did the attainment of parity make a difference? Did the system become more stable after Cuba as the Soviets caught up with the United States in terms of their nuclear arsenal. Well, this was an argument that uh, the then youthful Les Gelb made with Paul uh, Varnke in 1971. The United States and the Soviet Union, they wrote, are now in a constellation of parity, both sides possessing a secure second strike capability. As long as neither pursues an unreachable quest for superiority in the form of knockout first strike capability, there will be continued strategic stability. But this was the essence of the argument for parity, which recent writers 
uh, on the nuclear uh, arms race have emphasized as central to American uh, strategic doctrine, particularly in the 1970s. The great arms agreements of 1972, among the greatest achievements of the Nixon presidency, were designed to consolidate a new parity uh, and, so to speak, create a static system of mutually assured destruction at sustainable levels. The whole point of it was to make the system a, a more stable system of mutual deterrence. Once again, however, there's a but. Critics of the whole strategy of detente and the strategy of arms control feared and argued that the Soviets would exploit all arms control at negotiations, quote, to pursue a nuclear superiority that is not merely quantitative, but designed to produce the theoretical war-winning capability. In the words of Paul Nietzsche uh, and uh, my uh, retired colleague at Harvard, uh, Richard Pipes, the great expert on the Soviet Union, made exactly the same kind of argument. And guess what? They were right. If one looks at what happened in the period of so-called parity, in reality, the Soviets achieved a lead. These two charts uh, from the really magnificent three-volume Cambridge History of the Cold War uh, co-edited by our colleague Arna Westad here uh, tonight and Mel Leffler uh, illustrates the point I'm trying to make. These two charts, which I hastily scanned on my uh, way here today, show that the uh, Soviet Union, the dotted uh, line in both cases, overtook uh, the United States in terms of uh, intercontinental ballistic missile launchers. Meanwhile, the United States allowed its enormous lead in terms of strategic bombers to diminish and all but vanish. In other words, there is an argument to be made that those long, and my God, they were long and boring, and my God, they were boring negotiations about nuclear arms control were not entirely entered into in good faith by the Soviet side. The result of them was, in fact, to give the Soviets the kind of lead, though not quite such a big lead, as the Americans had enjoyed in the 1950s and early 1960s. Who won the arms race? Well, if winning was just a matter of accumulating destructive capability, the answer is the Soviets. Now, I want to suggest to you an entirely different interpretation of what went on as the Cold War moved from détente to the crisis of the uh, 1980s to its denouement in 1989. I want to suggest to you that we cannot find the answer in the realm of strategic theory. On the contrary, the answer comes from an unexpected place. It was the emergence much to the consternation of grand strategists like Henry Kissinger, of human rights as a major concern of Cold War politics that really propelled the Cold War to its denouement, and I believe also contributed to the delegitimization of nuclear conflict as an option. And it's that delegitimization which is crucial to understand. And, as I hope to show you, it is not coincidental that the critical insight of the entire Cold War into the relationship between nuclear weapons and human rights came from a nuclear physicist. He's the hero, as you'll see, of the story. A lot of good stuff is being written about the history of human rights right now. If you're interested in, in the subject, you can find not only an excellent essay in uh, in Arna's uh, co-edited uh, third volume, but also in the volume of essays in the 1970s that I co-edited with uh, Charlie Mayer and Dan Sargent, which came out uh, last year. What we, we see, beginning, I suppose, with the creation of Amnesty International in 1961, is a proliferation of non-governmental organization, Médecins Sans Frontières is another, which focused their efforts on the human rights which were supposed to be upheld by the United Nations uh, Charter of 1948, but which were repeatedly violated in the many Cold War conflicts that went on by proxy, as I described in the second lecture in the series. Human rights became a slogan, not only in the uh, NGO community, but also, of course, within the US Congress, where it became a stick 
with which to beat the proponents of détente and realpolitik, not least Kissinger. And, crucially, human rights became a slogan within the Warsaw Pact, within the Eastern Bloc as well, with the creation of the Moscow Human Rights Committee and the Samostat uh, publishing that brought uh, Solzhenitsyn and uh, others uh, to prominence within the Soviet intelligentsia and abroad. My hero is, of course, Andrei Sakharov. In June 1968, Sakharov wrote what I believe was the single most important essay of the Cold War. Progress, Coexistence, and Intellectual Freedom. And it's in this essay that Sakharov identifies the link between the danger of a nuclear war and the absolute primacy of individual freedom, of human rights. Let me quote from it and urge you to read it all. It was published, incidentally, uh, on page upon page of the New York Times the following month, July 1969. The views of the author, he writes, were formed in the milieu of the scientific and scientific technological intelligentsia. The division of mankind threatens the world with destruction. Civilization is imperiled by a universal thermonuclear war, catastrophic hunger for most of mankind, stupefaction from the narcotic of mass culture, and bureaucratized dogmatism, a spreading of mass myths that put entire peoples and continents under the power of cruel and treacherous demagogues, and destruction or degeneration from the unforeseeable consequences of swift changes in the conditions of life on our planet. Yes, it does read very well today, does it not? In the face of these perils, any action increasing the division of mankind, any preaching of the incompatibility of world ideologies and nations is madness and a crime. That's the insight, first phase. But here is the crux. Intellectual freedom is essential to human society. Freedom to obtain and distribute information, freedom for open-minded and unfearing debate, and freedom from pressure by officialdom and prejudices. Such a trinity of freedom of thought is the only guarantee against an infection of people by mass myths, which can be transformed into bloody dictatorship. Freedom of thought is the only guarantee of the feasibility of a scientific, democratic approach to politics, economics, and culture. Fearlessly, Sakharov demanded, in the conclusion of his essay, the following things from the Soviet leadership. The strategy of peaceful coexistence and collaboration must be deepened in every way. A law on press and information must be drafted, widely discussed and adopted, with the aim not only of ending irresponsible and irrational censorship, but also of encouraging self-study in our society, fearless discussion and the search for truth. The law must provide for the material resources of freedom of thought. All anti-constitutional laws and decrees violating human rights must be abrogated. Political prisoners must be amnestied and some of the recent political trials must be reviewed. The camp regime of political prisoners must be promptly relaxed. The exposure of Stalin must be carried through to the end. This was heroic indeed. And it laid the foundations or planted the seeds for what proved to be the decisive turning point in the Cold War, a turning point much underestimated by the administration that was responsible for it, the Ford administration. The whole idea of a conference in security and cooperation in Europe had come from the Soviet side. But it was from the American side that the idea uh, came to introduce clauses to the final act referring explicitly to human rights. This act was signed by 35 nations, eight of them communist, including the Soviet Union itself, and, incredibly, published in Pravda as an official document. It became the lodestar, the focal point, for all the dissident movements that sprang up before, during, and after the Helsinki period throughout Eastern Europe. If you look at the crucial parts of the Helsinki Final Act, you could see why this was the act of self-sabotage 
that brought the Soviet Union much closer than it was realized at the time to destruction. The participating states will respect human rights and fundamental freedoms, including the freedom of thought, conscience, religion, or belief, with, for or without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion. They will promote and encourage the effective exercise of civil, political, economic, social, cultural, and other rights and freedoms, all of which derive from the inherent dignity of the human person and are essential for his free and full development, and so forth. Which brings me to the plastic people of the universe. You can't really understand what went wrong in the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact countries without the plastic people of the universe. And if you never heard of them and didn't go to see Tom Stoppard's play Rock and Roll, well, I'm here to enlighten you. I wouldn't say that the plastic people of the universe are tremendously good to listen to today. In fact, it's really quite a racket. However, they exemplify what might be called the consequences, and also to some degree the causes, of Helsinki. Formed just after the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968, they sang a song called A Hundred Points. They are afraid of freedom. They are afraid of democracy. They are afraid of the Human Rights Charter. They are afraid of socialism. So why the hell are we afraid of them? They, of course, the nomenclatura, the communist apparat that ruled the country. In January 1970, their professional musicians' licenses were revoked. Two years later, they were banned from playing in Prague. And in February 1976, they were all arrested after an unofficial gig in the countryside. Two of them uh, were charged with, quote, extreme vulgarity, anti-socialism, nihilism, and decadence, and sentenced to jail terms of 18 and 8 months, respectively. This was the case that inspired Vaslav Havel to found Charter 77. It's about freedom. It's about freedom of expression. It's about freedom of thought. And by acknowledging that it is important, the Soviet Union had unwittingly opened the door to self-destruction. It's a little known fact that Mikhail Gorbachev studied at Moscow University with uh, one of the founders of Charter 77, Zenek Mlinar, and described him later as quote, probably the person I'm closest to, he always has been. When Gorbachev outlined his new thinking in 1986, two Russian, rather Soviet diplomats, he said, quote, on human rights, let us see what we can do. We need to move this current in the opposite direction. As Topfield said, the worst time for a bad regime is when it tries to reform itself. Nothing illustrates that proposition more perfectly than the career of Gorbachev whose reforms, by finally letting the Helsinki genie fully out of the bottle, condemned the Soviet Union and its empire in Eastern Europe to self-destruct. I showed you earlier the frequency with which the phrase nuclear war appeared in publications in the post-war period. Now compare it with the frequency with which the phrase human rights appeared in publications in the same period. The blue line is nuclear war. The red line is human rights. And I want to propose to you the hypothesis that it was ultimately human rights, a conversation about human rights, that ended the Cold War and rendered the notion of its ever becoming a hot war simply unpalatable, unswallowable, unacceptable. Let me bring you back to my killer app. <laughs> yes. The argument of the book is that there are six, and you need them all. You need to have competition in economic and political life, the multi-party system, which Sakharov also called for in his great essay. You need to have science, the freedom to research and to publish your findings freely. You need to have private property rights, the freedom to own things and not have them confiscated by an arbitrary power. You need to have medicine, the freedom from ill health, without which all these other freedoms are really rather meaningless. You need to have the consumer society, the freedom to go and buy and wear whatever you like, and even to listen to the plastic people of the universe, if that's your bag. And you need the work ethic, which incidentally 
as this is one of, I think, seven lectures I'm giving this week, this is just in case any representatives of the, of the beaver are present, I have. The Soviet system managed two out of six. And that was not enough. It didn't give its citizens any of the freedoms that the other killer applications provide. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of what Tony Blair calls a journey. <laughs> and let me offer some brief concluding reflections. In my view, the Cold War ended and did not become a hot war simply because, and fundamentally because, the Soviet system denied its citizens freedom, economic freedom and political freedom. And without those freedoms, no society can prosper. To understand the stagnation and sclerosis of the Soviet system in the 1970s, you need to understand how the incentives simply weren't there to work in a productive, creative way. Helsinki exposed, exposed the bogus nature of the Soviet claims, claims that were spelt out in the Stalinist constitution to be an agency for the uplift of workers and peasants and subject peoples. Destroyed its legitimacy, slowly but inexorably. That has some implications for our world today. Today, the United Nations Human Rights Council numbers among its members, and I was bound to mention it sooner or later, wasn't I? Libya proud sponsor of many educational establishments in the United States. <laughs> but also Saudi Arabia, not to mention China and Cuba. Not, I think you'll agree with me, countries famous for their respect for individual human rights. Since that UN institution is clearly a sham, and since that UN Charter achieved so very little during the Cold War, one obvious conclusion that we must draw from the history of the Cold War, that it is time, high time, we had a new Helsinki directed at today's unfree states. Thank you very much indeed. Neil. I, I said that Neil would take a few prisoners. He didn't. Um, he slashed and burned his way across a number of people there. He took a sort of walk down memory lane, at least for some of us. Sir John Hackett. Haven't heard that for a long time. Andrei Sakharov. Um, you do have appalling taste in music, Neil, it has to be said, but uh, we can forgive you. Can I uh, begin, however, with um, a question? Uh, I have a little bit of a provocation. You wouldn't be surprised to hear. You, you claimed and you said that you were a punk Tory, which I like. Uh, I like punks, so I'm not sure about the second, but there you go. Now, uh, Ronald Reagan, of course, is um, much a great hero of most Tories and most Conservatives, um, Mrs. Thatcher in particular. But uh, Ronald Reagan didn't emerge as a hero in your narrative. He actually emerged as an honorary member of CND. Could I uh, maybe then bring you back to another president just before Ronald Reagan? And it, it came to my mind as you were talking about human rights. Um, you might say the most liberal of American presidents, at least until Clinton and maybe Obama today, namely Jimmy Carter. Um, now, he's not a hero normally of either Tories or punks, and I didn't think he'd be a hero of yours. You didn't mention him. But the more you talked about it, the more I came to think that you were doing a rehabilitation of poor, attacked, vilified Jimmy Carter, who does not rank as one of the great presidents in American historiography or hagiography. But nonetheless, it does seem to me that as a president, he at least took human rights seriously. He promoted it reasonably aggressively through Big Noy Brzezinski. And I just want to kind of ask you the question, is this really a lecture to rehabilitate uh, Jimmy Carter? Well, thank you, Mick. That's a, a good question, uh, and the kind of good question one would expect from, I guess, 
If I was a punk Tory, what were you, a Baroque socialist? Oh, I was a... <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to you later about that, yeah. I, I was referred Classical to... Classical trot. I think I know mad trot, I think, mad trot. <laughs> But it's anyway. the music I'm trying to get at. Yeah, yeah. I While we were listening to the jam, what were the trots into? Oh, Pink oh, Floyd album. No, 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 no. Um, Go on, confess. Motown, in my case. Motown. So, that's so uncool. It's, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I even like Queen as well, you know. So, you know, that's enough confession. I just, I just You're moving it away from you now. Don't you love the idea of a whole <laughs> bunch of trots singing We Are The Champions? <laughs> We do it every week down at the Arsenal. (laughs) And always, you know, we'll keep on fighting until the end of capitalism. Right, okay. Answer the question. Answer the question. The Carter point's a good one because Carter campaigned on the human rights issue and Mm. and he picked that up uh, and it was one of the most successful uh, parts of his uh, his election campaign. It was much harder to turn it into a reality because you couldn't simultaneously drop all the human rights violating right-wing regimes that the United States was then sponsoring. Mm. That would have taken too long. Uh, and so what the Carter administration found, that they, once they had adopted that slogan, they were constantly tripping up uh, on the contradictions of their, their own position. But no, I wouldn't want to rehabilitate Carter, who I think was um, a singularly inept, uh, as well as unlucky president. It's actually Jerry Ford who I think mm. needs to be rehabilitated. Remember, although Carter campaigned on human rights, it was the Ford administration that got the Helsinki Final Act. And Ford remains the unsung hero, I think, of this phase uh, of the Cold War. Uh, There's an sense in which uh, he and Kissinger didn't realize that they had struck something close to gold at Helsinki. And they played it badly. They played the PR of Helsinki Mm. badly because it went so much against Kissinger's instincts, Mm. uh, which were to prioritize grand strategy, and particularly, as I argued last in the last lecture, to prioritize avoiding nuclear war and to regard human rights as a distraction from that primary moral purpose. So no, I, I think it's, it's not quite right to, to portray Carter as the hero here. Like, Carter in, in some ways was unlucky, most obviously uh, over Iran. It was on his watch that the great Islamic revolution began that so fundamentally altered the I- ideological landscape of the late 20th century. <laughs> Uh, but when one looks at his performance as a president overall, and indeed as at Brzezinski's performance as a national security advisor, I'd give them closer to a B, whereas I think Ford Kissinger was a far more impressive team. The trouble is that, and this is something I'm finding as I write the, the biography, there's so much more interest in Nixon because of Watergate and the associated uh, debacle that, that the Ford years go almost undiscussed in most books on the subject, and yet there's a huge amount that goes on in Ford. They, they also have to grapple with the great Soviet-Cuban offensive in, in Africa, which is a, an enormous uh, source of destabilization in the mid-1970s. But that's really the, the kind of implicit hero, I think, of this, of this story. All right. Um, just, okay, we've got a lot of notes for hopefully a lot of quick questions. Can I take the first one, please? Uh, there's a gentleman in the middle. Where's the microphone? Mike, are you here? How many mics do There's you have? a roving mic. So yeah, one, yeah. Roving towards you. Is there another mic over here? You're the other one. Okay. Is there another question over here? Uh, could you give that one? We'll take uh, one and gentleman there and then gentleman there. We'll do two together, Neil, if that's okay, sir? Sure. Please. Could you uh, turn on the mic, please? Or shout. Or shout. It is on. Oh, right. Hello. It's. <laughs> shout. Just shout. Here comes the other microphone. Yeah, here comes the other mic. That's I'm good. sure they never had this problem at meetings of Charter 77. No, we just shouted. For part of my life, I've been wondering, and the lecture tonight actually has helped me greatly to understand a lot more, but I think it's 1989 that Presidents Gorbachev and Reagan met, and this is the beginning of the disbanding, obviously, of the Eastern sect. What happened in that room? What would have they said to each other? Okay. Well, 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 oh, yeah. Give me just a sure. second. What, what did they say to each other in that room in 1989? Question there, gentlemen. Thank Sir? you. Um, with your conclusions, it's, um, you're saying that because the freedoms weren't there, that the Cold War didn't become a hot war. Does that mean that because the freedoms aren't there in a lot of these countries in the Middle East and the Gulf, a Cold War there will never become a hot war. Okay. 
let's start with those two questions, Neil, and then we'll no doubt pick up some more as we go along. I wish there had been time in, in this series to talk a bit more about what happened in 1989, because it's, it's actually important we understand it, given what's happening in the Middle East and North Africa right now. One of the important lessons, I think, of, of 1989 is that leaders play a relatively small role when revolutions get underway, once they've gathered a certain amount of, of speed. That there, were really, there was really only one act that, that could have uh, stopped uh, the 1989 revolutions, and that would have been a complete vault fast by Gorbachev and a military crackdown. Uh, now, that could have happened in a, one of... of several places. The, the, the moment that it nearly happened was Leipzig. If you talk to people who were in the streets of, of Leipzig as the demonstrations uh, grew and grew in the, in the uh, late summer autumn of 1989, there was a time when the military capability was on the streets to, dis to, to kill a lot of people. But, but Gorbachev refused to do that and uh, famously gave Honecker, Erich Honecker, the, the East German leader, the kiss of death. Once he had made it clear that the Sinatra doctrine had taken over, uh, th th that, that was the famous uh, doctrine that each of the socialist republics of the Eastern Bloc could do it its way, um, there was really no stopping this revolutionary contagion. And it, and it was a contagion. If you, if you just follow the sequence of events, uh, which I remember vividly, I was living in Germany that, at that time, it began with elections in Poland and the end, really, of, of, of any pretense that Poland was going to maintain a communist monopoly on power. Uh, it, led to, it, uh, it followed with the, the, the relaxation of travel restrictions uh, in Central Europe. Uh, and it, it culminated with the, the fall of the Berlin Wall in, uh, in November 1989 and the successive revolutions in, in, in Prague, ultimately, in, in Romania. That, that chain reaction unfolded over a period of about six months. Uh, and I think the role that Reagan and Gorbachev played in those events, once they had begun, was essentially minimal. Uh, Reagan had called on Gorbachev to tear the wall down, uh, but nobody had taken that seriously at the time. I mean, I, I have a funny story about this, which I, I can briefly tell. I was writing quite regularly under a variety of assumed names for British newspapers to eke out an existence uh, at a time when the pound was very weak relative to the Deutschmark. Uh, and uh, so I would uh, come out of the archives <coughs> where I was working and I would file uh, stories to the, the British press, usually as Alec Campbell, because I didn't want it to be revealed to my academic superiors that I was uh, engaging in such a vile activity as journalism. And one of the pieces that I filed in the summer, I think it was July of, of 89, was a piece which I speculatively headlined, the Berlin Wall is crumbling. And uh, I said, look, there are people traveling across from Friedrichstrasse in the east of Berlin with me on the S-Bahn to Zoologische Garten. That never happened before. There are poles everywhere. There are people from all over Eastern Europe. You can feel the Iron Curtain rusting away. And in a, an immortal decision, for which I will never forgive them, uh, the uh, subs or the deputy editor uh, of that newspaper phoned me up Hello, Neil. Oh, very, very disappointing news, I'm afraid. Uh, um, we've, we've not been able to use the piece, no. No, we've not been able to use the piece. The editor says you've been listening to one too many Ronald Reagan speeches. <laughs> so if, if they'd only printed that piece, I would be able to be the guy who predicted the fall of the Berlin Wall, <laughs> which no one did. Well, you did. Uh, and I don't even have the piece because it was written on a tandy, which if... The older yeah. people will remember it was a, a was a, a laptop with about as much memory as a mosquito. <laughs> so, so you filed the story and it disappeared off the minute hard drive. Anyway, th this is all a long a roundabout way of describing how far those events took on a life of their own beyond the initial impetus given by Gorbachev and by Reagan. I mean, I think Gorbachev is the far more important figure. Credit, though, has to be given to uh, George Bush Sr. because managing the subsequent uh, geopolitics of the breakdown of the Warsaw Pact, the reunification of Germany, and that was incredibly difficult stuff and called for very, very nifty footwork by Bush and Jim Baker 
Uh, and they really performed absolutely extraordinarily well in making sure that that crisis, and of course there's a more expert person here than me, David Manning, making sure that that crisis did not turn into the kind of uh, uh, major breakdown in superpower relations that it might have become. The stakes were extremely high. We look back on it now and we say, it all ended happily, it was bound to. But I don't think there was any guarantee that the re various revolutions in Central and Eastern Europe would not ultimately have produced more violence. And this brings me to the second question. Most revolutions, most imperial breakdowns, which of course was what 1989 was, do not end peacefully. The surprising thing about 1989 was how little violence there was in its wake. There was Yugoslavia, there was Nagorno-Karabakh, and that was about it. The probability was much higher that there would be, for example, major ethnic conflict in other parts uh, of Eastern Europe, particularly in places where the Russians suddenly went from being the masters to being an ethnic minority. And that was true of actually most of the republics that suddenly found themselves by 1991 uh, independent of Soviet rule. So I think if we look now at what is happening uh, in the Middle East, we need to bear in mind that it's very unlikely to be 1989. And I say that for a very important reason, which I, I sketched in a, in a piece for the Dear Old Evening Standard yesterday. By the time 1989 came, organizations like Solidarity uh, and like a Charter 77 had laid a foundation of civil society and secular, multi-party, democratic behavior that was remarkably solid. So that when the time came for the authoritarian regime to fold, the next generation of leaders was ready and waiting. And Havel went from being the bum, playwright, hippie, cool, uh, cigarette-smoking intellectual to being president. And who was his first state visitor? It was either Lou Reed... Yeah. I forget who the other oh, yeah. early invent Frank Zappa. 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 Was Lou Reed and Frank Zappa were the first yeah. visitors to Havel's presidential palace, which I think is is a wonderful, I suppose, a wonderful uh, a vindication of the Stoppard thesis that it really was about. It wasn't Freddie Mercury. It was about Rock. Mercury. You see, Freddie Mercury just wasn't oh, part okay. of this <laughs> story. <laughs> I'm gonna try. I mean, I, I'm just beginning to see how politically unsound Queen really was. <laughs> so I don't think that's true in the Middle East today. In other words, there is no, we have not helped build the kind of organizations, secular, open, committed to freedom, that we helped build in Eastern Europe in the communist period. And the work that went on by NGOs, and also it must be said by the CIA, to encourage those pro-Western, pro-secular, pro-democratic movements, has not gone on in the Middle East which is why I'm much more pessimistic about what's going to, what's going to unfold there. Okay, we've got... Um, are there any questions from... I'd take um, from... Yeah, there's a gentleman at the front here, White, first. And then... Um, uh, there's, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm only getting male hands going for the moment. Sorry, there's a gentleman over here with a... Yeah. So I'll take one and then two. Quick questions. One over here, please. Yeah. Um, so Soviet Union, if you like, was sort of a classic totalitarian... For ideological reasons, it wanted to control the economic sphere, so it had to be a political dictator, which was, of course, the great insight of Hayek. Um, modern totalitarians have sort of dropped their ideological sort of pretensions and need to control the economic and have realized, well, hey, we can still be political dictators and sort of let a degree of economic freedom happen. Um, you said tonight that ultimately you need both the economic and the political freedom for um, a society to be successful, to continue to innovate and implement those killer apps, if you like. Um, but last night at Intelligence Squared, you described democracy as a kind of a, a luxury good that had no causal implication on economic growth. But surely democracy and its sort of package of political freedoms that come with it are critical to economic freedom, as you said tonight. And there seems to be a bit of a tension between what you said here and what you said there. Okay. Everybody's reading the Evening Standard. Yeah. Oh, I know we have. I was there, indeed. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, based on what was done to create a civic-minded culture in Eastern Europe, um, why do you think there has been a dereliction of responsibility to do the same in the Middle East? In that when we've been speaking about the Middle East, we've really been speaking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which clearly we see today is not the source 
of all regional ills. Um, why has the efforts not gone into across the Middle East creating that? And one final thing. Um, I can appreciate why you're perceived as a populist, because despite being very enriching, you give a sense of atmosphere to the periods that you have described. Um, do you think you could add to that by perhaps singing Plastic People of the Universe? Because I actually don't know the tune. <laughs> that is... you can, he can do Colin Firth, but he can't do the Plastic People. All right? Chairs ruling. Neil, over to you. The argument of the, of the book, which, which is, is central, is that democracy isn't itself the killer app. If by democracy you mean holding multi-party elections and uh, basing governments on those elections and allowing all adults to vote in those elections. The critical point that I tried to make is that that practice only works if you have already downloaded the really important killer app, which I'm calling as a kind of shorthand private property, though I, I nearly called it the rule of law. Or I could have called it representative government, but it's not democracy that's the crucial thing. There are lots of places today that hold elections. Russia is one of them. But these elections are not elections that are conducted in the context of the rule of law or in the context of where private property rights are secure. Uh, and that kind of illiberal democracy is really very widespread in the world. It's a great mistake for us to assume that all we need to do is make people hold elections and everything will sort itself out. We've been trying to make that happen in Iraq now uh, since 2003, and it's an extremely difficult thing to make succeed if you don't have that foundation that I'm talking about. Now, what the killer apps give you is the kind of foundation for a democratic politics that, that Adam Smith had in mind when he wrote The Wealth of Nations and The Theory of Moral Sentiments. It's a combination of free market economics in which private property rights are secure and in which people pursue their own economic self-interest without the interventions of an arbitrary state and a civil society in which free association, free press free thought, and all of the other freedoms that we hold dear are, are possible. If you've got those things, then democracy will work. If you simply jump to holding elections, having overthrown a dictator, don't be surprised if the winners are intolerant people who are not committed to freedom, but on the contrary believe in the old principle of post-colonial politics, one man, one vote, once. <laughs> And, and that, I think, is a very real, a real and important point that often was lost in the discussions 10 years ago in neoconservative circles. I spent a lot of time trying to argue with American neocons that it was naive to think that all you had to do was privatize and hold elections, which was in some ways the kind of super crude formula uh, that came uh, to be the basis for policy in Iraq and elsewhere. You need much, much more of a sustained building of the institutions of the free market and civil society before a democracy is going to work. And that leads, I think, pretty naturally to the, the second question. Yeah, there's a kind of revelation here, uh, which it, not everybody wants to see, about the nature uh, of the, the greater Middle East, about the nature of the problems that afflict uh, that region. Uh, it's a, an extraordinary revelation and full of irony. One thing that's been revealed is that there could be a, a democratic wave in that region. And, and those who heaped scorn on the neoconservatives uh, eight years ago must, I think, now eat at least one portion of, uh, of humble pie. The project of a democratization of the region was not some kind of fantasy. The potential clearly uh, exists for that. However, and this is really the critical point, it is far from clear that the beneficiaries of this democratic wave will ultimately be the kind of people we would like to hang out with. There is an extremely serious risk that the principal beneficiaries will be, as we have already seen, uh, not least uh, in uh, recent uh, months in Lebanon, the uh, proponents of a radical Islam, Hezbollah, or for that matter Hamas, or the Muslim Brotherhood in the case of Egypt, or who knows in the case of Libya. 
So we're, we're witnessing a very, very different sequence of events from the ones that ended the Cold War. Uh, and that's why, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm relatively pessimistic about how this will turn out. The real problems of the region have to do with low levels of literacy, a very underdeveloped civil society, uh, an extremely youthful population, a population that has been kept in relative economic deprivation in, in, uh, in many cases. Those social problems are not really a natural seedbed for a Western-style democracy to emerge. They're a very natural seedbed for radical Islamists, however, who I still fear may be the main, the main winners of this revolution. Uh, we've got to 8 o'clock now, really, and I think we're going to have to call it to a conclusion. Lots of hands have gone up, but that's always a good sign that the lecture has uh, evoked uh, enthusiasm. Let me, before I move a vote of thanks for Neil, uh, just make a few very quick announcements. If you could just bear with me for just a moment. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, myself, uh, uh, Professor Westad and Neil will be on a platform uh, having a debate, although Neil will be chairing, although I'm sure he will get engaged. And that will be tomorrow night. It's called Out of Europe, America in an Asian Age. And that will be here, I think, tomorrow night at 6.30, so you're welcome to that. Longer term, I also want to make an announcement. Neil has been a wonderful uh, fourth uh, Philippe Ramon chair at the LSC. I just want to make the announcement that the fifth Philippe Ramon chair for next year will be the Indian historian Ramachandra Guha, an historian and biographer who lives and works uh, in Bangalore. For those of you who don't know the work of Ramachandra Guha, his books include groundbreaking works on environmental history, The Unquiet Woods, um, India After Gandhi, which I think is now seen as one of the standard histories of India, and of course, A Corner of a Foreign Field, A History of Cricket. So Ramachandra has, has um, some wonderful things to, to, to tell us, and we really look forward as a successor to Neil. Um, I'd also like to remind you, and Neil has done it again, he hasn't got enough at the moment. He said, could you go outside and please buy his book? Because he's a bit hard up. Um, so it'll be just out here, and so that'll be there. And could I finally just call upon all of us, so whether you agree or don't agree with Neil, and as you know, I kind of agree, but quietly disagree. I think it's been a fantastic contribution to the LSC. His lectures have been full houses every time. They've all been brilliant performances, whatever you think. I just think it's been great having it here. Could we say goodbye, but say also thank you for this evening's great presentation. Neil. Thank you.